Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. In this episode of Frankly Speaking, we hear from Ali Alassiri, the former Saudi ambassador to Pakistan and Lebanon. We ask the extent to which Israel's actions contribute to the proliferation of regional terrorism and the ramifications for Lebanon as the crisis extends beyond Gaza. Plus, can Pakistan's new prime minister navigate the challenges to steer the country towards stability? And we uncover the valuable lessons Saudi Arabia can offer in fostering peace within the region. Ambassador, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, you authored a book about how Saudi Arabia fought and defeated terrorism, which plagued the kingdom close to 20 years ago. Frankly speaking, given what is going on today in the region with the ongoing atrocities in Gaza, do you not feel that Israel is contributing to the creation of regional terrorism 2.0? And what would your advice be to resolve this conflict? Well, uh, definitely, what what's uh, you know happening in Gaza does contribute to to a rise of terrorism, unfortunately. And the answer is Israel has to stop immediately and and uh, and uh, deal in a human way with with uh, with those hostages who have been taken in without being tortured and 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 uh, yeah, taken you know into other areas where their parents they have no idea where everybody is. So Israel need to stop and immediate stop. That, that's the answer to this. And of course, shocking devastation there. We know ceasefire talks continue to falter as well. But let's talk about the effects of the crisis being felt in other countries, more widely throughout the region. You were also ambassador to Lebanon and certainly quite the expert when it comes to Lebanese politics. So tell me, how do you see the ongoing war in Gaza spilling over into Lebanon, which, as we know, is already facing sky high inflation levels around 250% growing poverty and a very fragile infrastructure system. Well, it, indeed, it, it's contributing to the northern of Israel, to the south of Lebanon. Uh, you know, there is tick and tap uh, between Hezbollah and, and, and uh, Israel. Uh, we hope this doesn't escalate to further war, because if we remember the 2006 uh, war has devastated Lebanon. And all Lebanese, they really don't want war. They want peace. They have bad economy. They have bad governance. They have corrupted uh, uh, system in their in their uh, uh, banks. Uh, so they, they don't need war. You know, they need peace and prosperity. That's what the Lebanese do. I see some efforts being made by by the U.S. Uh, sending their envoy to between Israel. He has shuttled diplomacy between Israel and, and Lebanon, and hopefully that would uh, contribute to a real ceasefire. That, you know, and, and, and we hope also that ceasefire will take place in, in, in Gaza. Ramadan is coming and the brutality that we have seen uh, will not make any happy, uh, whether any human being, uh, especially in the Muslim world. Absolutely. And meanwhile, we continue to see the death roll rise. We've seen people trying to access aid trucks being targeted as well. And the stories and the atrocities that are coming out every day are absolutely shocking. But let me ask you about Hezbollah, because they've remained mostly out of the conflict. So, Ambassador, in your opinion, does that signify a weakened position? Or do you think Hezbollah has shown its true colours, that it's not actually interested in Palestine and only wants to control Lebanon? Well, Hezbollah, actually, the, the command comes from Iran, and it depends what Iran wants. And, and uh, Iran will just, you know, Hezbollah will uh, uh, listen to the command that comes from Iran. Uh, Iran is trying to use their armed militias, uh, whether it's in Iraq or, or uh, Yemen or, or Lebanon uh, to, to, to uh, uh, as a bargaining chip with, with the USA. So uh, unfortunately, they, they, they don't have the authority to uh, say what they want to say. They are Lebanese, uh, but they, they, their uh, supporter, great supporter is Iran. And, and uh, uh, they, they will, the command will just come from Tehran. 
Meanwhile, we continue to see Tehran try and flex its muscles in the region. But let me look a little bit more widely. Looking at Pakistan, you were also ambassador there as well. Now, we've seen the elections take place recently. Shabazz Sharif has been elected in as the prime minister for the second time after securing 201 votes. Tell me, how far do you think the 2024 elections can go in bringing stability to Pakistan, which, as we know, is facing skyrocketing inflation, unemployment, debt burden, energy shortages, and the rising cost of essential items there as well? Well, I, I, I'm actually uh, optimistic because the Shahbaz Sharif is, is a very well experienced uh, individual who has been the chief minister of the Punjab, which is uh, you know the biggest province in, 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 in Pakistan. Uh, so he has the uh, experience and also he seems to select so far a, a real good professional team. So uh, that that lead me, you know, to be optimistic. I don't think it could, could get worse because the economy has really been very bad. The IMF has been very difficult with Pakistan uh, due to so many reasons. Uh, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, with the help of good professional ministers and, and a good leading individual, a good leader, as Shahbaz Sharif, I think um, uh, Pakistan hopefully would would, would uh, pick up and and, and uh, deal with the economy, and I think that that was uh, the slogan through the uh, election. But but Shahbaz is, is, is a very well experienced individual, and he knows what to do. So let's hope, you know, because Saudi Arabia and, and Pakistan really enjoy a great relationship, uh, you know, ever since. Uh, before even Pakistan was Pakistan, since 1943, King Abdul Aziz sent his sons to, to Karachi when they had floods to help Pakistan. And their relationship grows with every leadership. It's people-to-people -people relationship. The relationship is really unique, profound, and durable. So, uh, you know, Pakistan is a great ally of Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and, and I'm sure, you know, they, they, uh, they, they appreciate this unique relationship. Well, let's talk about some of those challenges. In your opinion, what should the priorities be for the new government? We've recently seen them push for new talks with the IMF to try and fast track uh, the new loan program. So I know uh, you know Mr. Sharif personally. If you could sit down with him, what advice would you give him for navigating the year ahead? Well, first of all, I think he should look into the uh, governing part and, and fight corruption. I think that, well, you know, that's the most important thing. Secondly, there are a lot of resources uh, in Pakistan that has not been touched at all. Thirdly, the, the many fact, you know, the, there is a, a very industrial, one of the best industrial cities I have seen is called Sialkot. And, and, and they, you know, they have, I mean, the FIFA football is made, made there. You know, they have really leather, they have products, they have surgical equipment. They have, so if they could focus on those and upgrade those factors, then, attract investment, whether from Saudi Arabia or the GCC uh, countries, I think that that would help a great deal. Uh, I'm sure that, that they will get help from the IMF. The government is a credible government, provisional government. So I think they are bargaining with, with the IMF would, would not be as difficult as it has been in the past with other government. So that, that's why, I you know, I think... Um, uh, with, with, also, they are experienced. They know what to do. They are... Uh, I think they picked up one, you know, very highly experienced man exposed to the world economy. Uh, he, I think he worked at the, uh, so many banks of, uh, outside Pakistan to be the Minister of Finance. So that's the, you know, the, 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 what I see is as a great progress to select professional uh, ministers. You know, relevance is so important when, when you put a minister on, on the seat. So I think hopefully everything would be better than it is today. Okay, so you clearly have a very positive outlook and opinion of him, but a number of analysts have come out and said many people feel there's a real lack of public trust in Mr. Sharif's administration. We've seen the opposition, mainly Imran Khan and his followers, they say the people's mandate has been stolen in the last election. Now, the Imran Khan-backed candidates did remarkably well. They secured around 93 seats despite being hit with a number of criminal charges and being disqualified from holding any kind a public office. So, in your opinion, how fair and transparent do you think these polls were? Uh, you know, I, I, I spent nine years in Pakistan, and every election you would have the same slogan from the opposition. 
So uh, I, I wouldn't really give it much credit, uh, you know, to, to what they say. The point here is who is going to help Pakistan. Obviously, opposition, they will always have something to say against the, the, the uh, uh, government, uh, whether it's Imran Khan or, or the others. Uh, Imran Khan, only he won a lot of seats in the, in the West, uh, in Khaybar and, and uh, towards uh, Afghanistan. And uh, uh, to be honest with you, and I, I think uh, uh, the, the governance in the past was not as good and professional as, uh, as it should have been. Uh, and and uh, obviously, uh, the Pakistani people, they know exactly what helped them to pick up their economy. Their uh, currency has fallen so bad in the, in the last three, four years. So uh, I think the answer is to have a good governance. And what we see today leads me to be very optimistic. So clearly, some big challenges still remain. If we were to look at the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, where do you see the main highlights of this relationship? And, and how do you think that has evolved over the last few years? Well, it, it, uh, uh, first of all, the, the relationship is not really, unfortunately, it's not based on interest. It's ba it's, it's, it is based on um, which usually a relationship between countries, you know, uh, it serves their interest and, and both sides. With Pakistan, our, our base of relationship is our strong be belief. And, and Pakistanis are a very uh, conservative uh, uh, Muslim society. And, and, and their, their love for the holy places in Saudi Arabia and, and uh, uh, the, the, you know, it, it's outrageous. I mean, I had one of the Imam Harams who, who visited Pakistan and you wouldn't believe 500,000 people prayed you know, behind him, even outside the mosque in, in Islamabad. So that sure reflects how, how much their love and affection towards the holy places and then towards Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has never let Pakistan down in, 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 in time of need. And to, from King Abdul Aziz also, even to, to King Salman, the Crown Prince has visited several times Pakistan because he knows how important Pakistan is and how important our relationship is. And therefore, you know, the, I mean, I could speak hours on, on, the, on the relationship, which we hope that we will translate this love and affection into, into good economy between both countries because we have the PIF and they could really go to Pakistan and invest in great factories and upgrade them to, you know, to produce more so Pakistan will benefit and also Saudi will benefit. So there are many, many areas now with the new leadership, you know, dynamic Saudi leadership uh, we have and the strategy, economic strategy that we have. I think we can help Pakistan more and they will help themselves also. Well, certainly a lot of potential there. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on their relationship with Saudi Arabia, though. We mentioned earlier, you know, Mr. Sharif, what can you tell us about his leadership traits? Do you think he is the right man for the job in Pakistan in the year ahead? You had quite a positive outlook for him earlier. But in terms of your personal relationship with him, what are the real standouts for you? Well, I, I, I see for this period, I think he is the best to be chosen due to his experience his patriotism, his loyalty to his country, and, and uh, his acceptance, uh, you know, to, to most people. Uh, obviously, they have coalition government now, and it's always that way in Pakistan. You can never have one major party run the country, which is sometimes, you know, it contributes to goodwill because the coalition, you know, is, is uh, uh, a deterrent to, to uh, over-governance. So... Uh, I, I would say for the time being, and what I know of his experience, his, his personality, his loyalty to his country, I think uh, 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 this leads me to always repeat my optimism and prayers for them to succeed because Pakistan is in a bad, really economic uh, situation now. What would your advice be to him when it comes to Saudi Arabia? Well, uh, my advice to him is, is, is to look into the economy, to fight the corruption, and, and, and to really, you know, try to upgrade the, the industrial cities because they have really good materials. They, they export to America, you know, uh, fabrics and, and things. Uh, and, and so the economy is, 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 is the answer to, to help Pakistanis and Pakistan uh, and, and, you know, to raise, try to, to, to raise, uh, to attract tourism, I mean, uh, investment from uh, everywhere, I would say. 
Well, whilst the relationship between Saudi and Pakistan has certainly grown closer in the last few years, we continue to see a lot of animosity between India and Pakistan. But I was interested that in an article you published in Arab News back in January 2022, you argued, in fact, that the two arch rivals actually can benefit greatly from cooperation. But let's be frank, the leaders in both countries seem to have ignored that advice. We've seen a very strained relationship in the last few years. So tell me, do you believe that enhanced relations between these two nuclear powers is still possible and how? Well, I, I, I truly... I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the tension is so high. So I, what I would suggest is really to, to, you know, because this had happened in the past when I was actually serving in Pakistan. What is needed is to reduce the tension between the two countries to allow, because family, you know, there are families in Pakistan, family in India who are, you know, relatives. So to, to ease the uh, access and, and, and travel between Pakistan and uh, uh, India, to ease the, you know, the business, uh, deals between Pakistan and India. This would, would hopefully lead to a, a very constructive discussion between the both countries and ultimately, hopefully, would lead to peace and, and, and uh, stability in both countries. Because the, the animosity is, is, you know, it's so, the tension is very, very uh, really uh, high and, and we need to go gradual to reduce that tension in order to, to have a reasonable, uh, uh, logical discussion, you know, between the, both leaders in both countries. Well, we continue to see huge conflicts over the disputed region of Kashmir. We see religious differences, ongoing territorial disputes as well, all putting huge strain on this relationship. Do you think that countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE can play a role in mediating between both sides I have no doubt, yes, the answer, should, you know, I would say yes, because both countries enjoy a very good relationship with both countries, with India and, and Pakistan. And, and I, I hope, you know, in, in the future, but, you know, it's a process. It cannot be really, you know, uh, uh, done in, 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 in a short time. The, the process would, would, would ultimately needs, it leads to, to a good compromising solution between both countries. But yes, the, and the answer to, to your good question is uh, yes, indeed, if needed. And uh, both countries enjoy a good relationship with, with both countries. Now, New Delhi maintains that for any dialogue to be able to begin, they say Pakistan must stop cross-border terrorism. Now, this is an area of expertise for you in particular. We saw Saudi Arabia's victory over terrorism several years ago. And this was not only a military success, of course, but an ideological one too. So tell me, how did the kingdom achieve this? You've spoken a lot about the importance of prevention to being able to ensure rehabilitation as well. So what can you tell us about the al Saha program? Is it still ongoing? And what are the real key achievements of this? Actually, I have written a book on this, but I don't think the time would permit us to go very long. But I would briefly, you know, Saudi Arabia has uh, adopted a, a very comprehensive strategy to counter terrorism, including uh, military as well as non-military instruments. But the three prone strategies you kindly mentioned, number one is prevention, which means, you know, uh, heavy because our, our youngsters were misled and been taken in and indoctrinated. So they, they, they were not, you know, uh, familiar with the real spirit uh, message of Islam, and uh, these people were taken by by extremists who, who were able to influence them. And we have to remember, religion in any religion is is a great influence in on the individuals. But uh, then you know, so Saudi Arabia had a very good campaign to prevent this on the media, the, the religious discourse, moderate religious discourse in the mosques and the radio and cassettes and so forth. So they were the awareness, a very big awareness program that was done to, to lead with the with the mindset of, of, of those who think to become terrorists or, or have been indoctrinated and taken in by, by those extremists. So you know that, that was the, the prevention. Then the, the cure for for uh, committees were, you know, after arresting those deviant individuals and detained, then uh, uh, a, a, a committee formed, uh, you know, four uh, different subcommittees. One is, is uh, religious scholars who would go and 
that's a subcommittee that would, would talk to the individuals, try to correct the perception that they have, the image they have, the wrong image of Islam that, that they have been told, and, and try to, to really educate them, the moderate Islam and the good, good peaceful you know, spirit of Islam. So that's the religious scholar. Then you come to so, you know, social and psychological and uh, uh, you know, uh, other professionals, uh, psychiatrists also, they, they take role after the religious leaders. And they talk to them and they try to assess where, what went wrong with them. Then after that, you have a security committee which evaluates the, the, how, you know, how well the, those committees have, have achieved. And is this person, you know, uh, back to normal? Uh, can we trust to be here? This person will come out in the committee. Today, there is one man who, who, who is still in jail who thinks uh, he's the only Muslim in the whole world. And, and uh, you know, such a man, you couldn't do anything. But the effective uh, strategy that the Saudi Arabian government has taken to, to really deal with this menace uh, has been really, really successful. Then you have a media subcommittee also, which you know spread the same message that you know they have learned from those individuals and try to correct uh, and help those to prevent others from you know getting into the same business. Then the last strategy is care, which means you know those people who have been arrested and have been rehabilitated fully and trusted to be back as a normal people. The government had helped them. They gave them jobs. They they uh, helped them to get married. Uh, they are back into the society, and 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 that I would say this has been the most successful strategy in the whole world. You know, we we have seen other countries where they arrested terrorists and they tortured them and they interrogate them and and you know they they stay in jail for a long time or they come back and go to the same business. Uh, so I, I would, uh, I'm very honored to see our, our government has taken the, a civilized approach to deal with this uh, phenomena that has nothing to do with Islam. Islam has been hijacked by, you know, extremists and radicals. And today, uh, you know, with a new strategy in Saudi Arabia that has been implemented and the role that the current government uh, has taken in, in, in entertainment and recreational centers and you know, uh, the youngsters are, are, are happy and, and I don't think they would ever think of getting back or, or you know, to be terrorists again, never. And I think you make such an important point about rehabilitation. The fact that people have the opportunity to take part in education, counselling, as well as vocational training to help them reintegrate into society is key. Tell me, how do you believe that these kinds of measures can really serve as a model for other nations around the world facing similar challenges? I, 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 I can't say proudly. Many countries have copied the Saudi strategy um, in the Arab world and, and also in, in other countries in, in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. I, I'm sure they, they have learned so much from Saudi Arabia. And, and uh, I think it's, it's all over now. The Saudi strategy is not only a regional uh, strategy, I think it has, uh, you know, spread uh, to, to many, many countries, especially the Muslim countries. Well, it is an incredible program. I know you've spoken a lot about of it in your book. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We really appreciate your insights, not only into the crisis in Gaza and the relationship between Pakistan and Saudi, but how we can hopefully eventually bring peace to the Middle East. We do appreciate your time today. Thank you. Well, I appreciate having me and thank you very much, Katie.